It's the start of a brand new week. Good morning and welcome to Newsdex. We're live on DSTV Channel 421 and Go TV Channel 125. Across all our social media handles, we are Joy News on TV. You can watch us live around the globe on myjoyonline.com. Coming up this morning, the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission warns the cost of electricity and water will continue to rise unless government fixes the depreciation of the city against major trading currencies and rising cost of fuel. We have details as the electricity tariff will be increased by 5.8% and water will see an upward adjustment of 5.1% effective July 1, 2024. Also in this bulletin, four legal challenges against the passage of the controversial Human Sexual Rights and Family Values Bill 2024 are back in court today as the Judicial Service grants full media access. Stay with us. Also in this bulletin, today marks nine years since the fatal June 3rd disaster, which claimed the lives of 154 Ghanaians. Stay as we engage the National Disaster Management Organization on lessons learned. And in our hotline documentary, we asked the question, should the teacher licensure exams be cancelled? Because all the teachers who sat for the exams have certificates from institutions that qualify them to teach already. I am Faustina Safa. Take a seat. Be my guest. Thanks for staying with us. Now we start with the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission because they are warning the cost of electricity and water will continue to rise unless government fixes the depreciation of the city against major trading currencies and the rising cost of fuel. The PURC announced an increase in water and electricity tariffs for the second quarter of 2024, effective July 1 to September 28. 2024. Now, according to the Commission, Electricity Lifeline consumers will see a 3.45% increase for the same consumption level as in the first quarter. Other residential electricity consumers above the Lifeline bracket will experience a 5.84% increase, while industrial users will face a 4.92% increase. Now, water tariff will be increased by 5.16% for cons consumers um, during this period. Now, the commission explained that the upward revision is primarily due to the depreciation, depreciation of the city, which has lost about 20.8% of its value between the first and second quarter of the year. Now, a 5.23 increase in the cost of fuel, particularly natural gases, will also be seen. Now, on your screens now, would come details of this statement from PURC because it's, it's going to give us a better picture as to what we are to expect. Now, if you just tuned in, you're watching news decks and we're discussing the increase in, in um, fuel and tariffs and how it is affected by fuel. Now, on your screens, it will come shortly um, why this is happening, because the PURC is saying that this is as part of measures to fix what is going on in the country. Now, what you're seeing now is the utility type for consumer group and the increment. Now, for the various consumer groups, we have percentage increments. For electricity, it's been divided into three. We have the lifeline, the above lifeline, and the industry use. Now, for the lifeline consumers, you are expected to now pay a 3.45% increment. If you're above lifeline, it's 5.84% increment. Now, for industry players, who are the big guys in the industry using lots of electricity, they expect to pay 4.92% increment. Now, for water, there is no consumer group for water. If you use water in this country, you are expected to pay 5.16% 
increment and this is coming from the PURC. Let's move on to the next slide. Now, what are the factors causing this increment? For many people, they want to know why they are paying so much. Key reason the PURC gave in their statement is the depreciation of the CD by 20.8% between the first and second quarter. So that is one of the key reasons they are giving for the increment in tariffs. The second key reason they give, apart from the depreciation of the city, is increment in cost of fuel by 5.23%. Now, this is another concern raised by drivers and motorists, that fuel prices have been going up all the time and it's affecting business and for us it's going to be affecting our pockets because we have to pay now more for electricity and water because there's increment in the cost of fuel by 5.23 percent now let's move on to the next slide now we're going to be finding out if at all this increment is going to help solve the problem prc sees because now this is the electricity revenue gap ecg this is where we are going to talk about ecg now, ECG's revenue target in the first quarter, meaning from January to March, was 5.67 billion Ghana cities. In the second quarter, it shot up to 6.81 billion. Now, what does that mean? It means that as consumers, we would have to be paying more because of this increment in their revenue target, meaning to run ECG, they require 6.81 billion Ghana cities. So ECG says, you know, it's too much for Ghanaians. Let's bring it down. So they revised this number and they brought it down to 5.9 billion Ghana cities because they want to cushion the consumer. They don't want us to pay so much at a go. Now, but what is this creating? This is creating a shortfall of 900 and 6.21 million Ghana cities. And ECG says that this figure would be rolled over in subsequent quarters. So it means right now, the increment that they have even put out, which is 5.8%, is just for now. So you should be expecting to pay more for electricity in coming months because for ECG to hit their revenue targets for the second quarter, this is actually what they need to do. They will have to push down the cost to you and I, the consumer. So let's get more from this and speak to Dr. Eric Obute. He's been working um, with the PULC. He's Director of Research and Corporate Affairs. Dr. Eric Obute, join us now on Newstex to get a better understanding about why PULC is doing this and what their concerns are. Thank you for your time here on Newsdesk. Now, until Today, we have been battling with forex exchange and tariffs going up. But explain to us why exactly the depreciation of the city is specifically impacting electricity and water tariffs. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I hope you can hear me. I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. I just want to correct a few things before I move on to the substantive question that you asked me. Okay. Uh, you are talking about the the revenue requirement for ECG. The revenue requirement you see there is not only for the ECG, mm. it's for the electricity sector. It covers generation, transmission, and distribution. Mm. ECG just happens to be at the tail end. So ECG collects the money mm -hmm. and then pays these other people in the sector, in the chain. So it pays VRA, pays Greco, pays the IPPs, pay, and then those people in the chain before it pays itself. So the revenue requirement you see of uh, six billion mm -hmm. is actually six point eight billion is actually for the sector mm. and not only for ECG. Okay. Now the sector requirement for the first quarter was five point six seven, and mm. for the second quarter is six point um, eight. Now if you strike the difference, the difference is about one point one billion. So the one point one four billion is what is supposed to be used to run the electricity sector for the second quarter. So it's not only going for the ECG. Second point I also want to put across is you made mention of the fuel prices and mm. the drivers. Mm. Now the fuel prices you talk of are, are natural gas prices. Mm. And natural gas prices are not the LPG that we use in our homes. This is lean gas which is supposed to be used in powering the thermal plants. 
the thermal plants, the gas that they use is different from the gas that we use to cook at home. So these are two separate things. And again, this statement is a PURC statement and not an ECG statement. So I want us to position it clearly that these percentages and stuff that you see is coming from the PURC and not from the ECG. Noted. Now, you mentioned a 5.23 increase in the cost of fuel, particularly natural gases. Yes. And how does this fuel cost hike translate into higher tariffs for me, a consumer? Okay. Um, the more you increase the fuel costs, the more your cost of operation goes up. And that will translate into you getting enough cash to be able to buy the fuel before you power the plants. Now, if you're not able to get enough cash to power, to buy the fuel to power the plants, then that means that your cost of service or the quality of service that you render to the people will be abysmal. So definitely it will translate into higher cost of um, tariffs. For instance, you made mention of truck, truck drivers or taxi drivers. As long as your, the fuel prices that they use goes up, the cost of transporting you also goes up. It's the same thing with electricity. The fuel cost goes up and we do not have control over it. The utility service provider does not have control over it. So it will definitely be a cost that will be passed through to the end user. So it will definitely affect the end user as long as the prices go up. Mm. Are there any alternative energy sources being considered to mitigate the impact of this rise in fuel costs? Well, the alternative is to go for renewables. Mm -hmm. And it's in the policy that by the year 2030, the renewables should constitute 10% of our electricity generation. Mm -hmm. Now, but these renewables in the form of solar, wind, and all those, they are not uh, very reliable. You still need a traditional system to be able to run the electricity effectively. Because if you take solar, for instance, whenever there's cloud cover, you tend not to be able to use the solar effectively. You don't have, you need to depend on the traditional system or the conventional system to be able to power the electricity, to power your homes. So the, the alternatives are there, but the traditional system will always be there just to make sure that it complements the, uh, uh, the renewables that we have. Mm. Help us understand how PURC determines the specific tariff increment for each consumer class. Because in your statement, there are different percentages and increments for electricity, lifeline, consumer, industrial users. How do you come across the final tariffs for this bracket? Okay. Uh, we do have the 0 to 30 kilowatt hour bracket, which is purely for the lifelines. And then we do have other residential customers, which is beyond 31. So if, you ask, if your consumption is beyond 30, let's say 31, you are no longer a lifeliner. A lifeliner is supposed to be somebody who is the poorest of the poor in society. So they are able to use just very bare minimum electrical appliances, light, fan, uh, a TV, a radio, that's it. But as long as you are using fridges, deep freezers, um, um, ACs, you are beyond the lifeline. You move on to other lifeline, other uh, tariff brackets. So the lifeline, we said to recover the, the revenues that we need for the sector, the commission in its wisdom said, look, we cannot recover everything. Let's recover only part because the living conditions in the country, they are too dire for everyone. So if you want to push through everything, that means that the tariff will be so high that people will not be able to afford it. So we are pushing through only a quarter of that, the 1.1 billion, only a quarter of that will be absorbed. Mm. And then the rest will be spread over subsequent quarters of the year. So the, for the first bracket, you need the tariff adjustment to be 3.45% upward. Mm. So if let's say you pay 50 CDs as a lifeliner, the next time you are going to buy power to be able to get the same amount, the next time around July ending, you need about 52 CDs or 53 CDs to be able to buy the same amount, I mean, same amount of power. So you've added onto it two CDs extra or three CDs extra maximum. That's what it's supposed to be. So um, if you go to the next bracket, it's 5.84, the same thing. So if let's say you spend 100 CDs, at the end of July, you're supposed to pay about 106 CDs. 
So six CDs extra will be added on to it. That's how it's uh, calibrated. Just so that we can meet the revenue requirement, a quarter of it, the rest will be spread over the subsequent quarters. Given the current trends, what are your projections for electricity and water tariffs in the next few quarters? Well, that cannot be determined at this point in time. It mm. can only be determined when we get to the end of September and we know what the exchange rate will be, what the fuel cost will be, what inflation will be, and the generation mix between thermal and hydro. That is when we'll be able to determine. We need to do some number crunching based on the figures that we have, and that will determine what the tariffs will be for the next quarter. That's the third quarter of 2024. Are there any regulatory changes being considered to better manage you know, future tariff adjustments? Regulatory changes, we're trying to make sure that people will pay the cost, the true cost of serving them. Mm. If you take the industrial class, for instance, you realize that the industrial class, the cost of serving the industrial class is lower than the cost of serving the residential class. So we do it in such a way that gradually the, the residential class will pay the true cost of serving them whilst the industrial class also pay their true cost of serving them. So in this tariff in the previous quarters, you also realize that the industrial class, even though the adjustment is upwards, is lower than the adjustment in the case of the residential classes. So those are some of the regulatory changes that we are making. Mm. Thank you so much, Eric, for your time here on Newsdex. Now, today marks exactly nine years since the June 3rd disaster, the day which was marked around the country as a black day for Ghana, claimed the lives of 104 people and left many scarred for life. Now, the tragedy occurred after several hours of torrential rainfall in the capital city, Accra. Now, during the downpour, Fuel leakage from Gore Station at Kwame Nkrumah Circle caught fire from a cigarette stub near the area, resulting in an explosion alongside the flood. The floods were attributed to blockages in across main storm drains, resulting from non desilting of the drains, including buildings and structures by squatters that had blocked waterways. Now, nine years on, we explore the lessons learned, but first, let's bring back this report from my colleague, Maxwell Agwagwa, which better paints the picture of the harsh reality faced by those who survived the disaster. It is the evening of June 3, 2015. Flat water has displaced fuel from the storage tank underground at the fuel station at Circle. What we know is that a cigarette butt was dropped on the water, triggering a big explosion and a huge fireball that turned the skies orange. The flames continued to burn. <coughs> Solomon Akrugu was just 12 years old sitting in a room nearby. He suffered severe bends on his face. It completely disfigured him. Eight years later on a Monday morning, I meet Solomon at East Legon doing what he does every day, begging for arms. That is his only means of survival. He used to sell air freshness but lost his capital when a friend stole his wares. Begging on the streets of East Ligon is very difficult for him. Sometimes he gets nothing even after begging the whole day. He says some drivers do not want to see him close to their cars because of his disfigured face. He tells me about an incident where a man asked him to remove the mask he was wearing and stop begging on the streets. We see here the didn't the this time we traffic and send a message and a man be. I only get food to eat when I go to the traffic light to beg for money. Many people do not give me money there. Some of them suck me when I get closer to their cars. Some of them think I am wearing a mask. A man once told me to go and look for a job and stop wearing the mask. A lot of people tell me that.
Bebre, I'm a I am really suffering here. The hardship is real. I am always scared when it starts raining because I am homeless. I always sleep in front of shops because I do not have a place I call my home. Solomon's Parents separated after the fire destroyed their house at Seco. He fears no woman will be attracted to him because of his disfigured face. He says marriage will be difficult because no woman is attracted to him. I really need the surgery because I am experiencing a lot of stigmatization. People do not want me closer to them because of my disfigured face. That's why I need the surgery. Because that will also help me get a woman to marry later in life. For now, no woman wants me. Even the drivers in cars find it difficult to give me money. Nobody wants me around. When the sun is out and hot and the light hits my face, it's really painful. That's why I need help. I can't touch it because blood will start oozing from my face if I do. So I go and hide in the shade until it's evening. He's pleading for a job as a tiler and is also begging for assistance for plastic surgery. There are many Solomons out there who are living the trauma of the June 3 floods. Victims of the disaster, including Solomon, are yet to be compensated. Last year, the One Ghana movement reminded the government to do so. Yes, a member, Senor Husi. As expected, authorities trooped in to this very space and on the streets, promising as usual to bring perpetrators to book. Seven years on, no one has been held accountable for this very avoidable disaster. The government of the day and the government today have all but paid lip service to justice, accountability, and commensurate compensation for victims. The One Ghana movement has since 2017 been pursuing justice for the persons affected. One of their lawyers, Samson Ladi Anyenini, led the matter in court in 2018. The case is still pending. He says it has been a very slow process. Because there have been what we call interlocutory processes um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the course. Uh, but just very recently, we seem to have cleared some of the hurdles. Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, we're in court, you know, this week. Mm -hmm. uh, apart from the plaintiffs that were mobilized by one Ghana movement, mm -hmm. we know as a matter of fact, um, later, as we discovered, that there were many more who were affected mm -hmm. who are not part of the suit in court. Mm -hmm. Some had left to their villages, some had left to their hometowns, various places. Um, it's unfortunate that the law has a limitation period within which you can take a suit. And in excess of five years, you don't have that opportunity. Um, but I believe that even for those who are in court, the, the state could look at this more carefully and see what could be done to everybody. Um, for as long as there will be evidence to show that somebody is suffering as a result of what happened, I think that the state could look at being the father for all kind of thing. Many continue to live through these dangerous floods of trauma and others are scarred for life. Maxwell Awagba, join us. 
Let's bring in the Director of Communications at the National Disaster Management Organization, George AEC, joining us via phone to discuss about the lessons learned nine years on. Now, your team was quite busy that day. Share with me your reflections. Are you talking to me? Yes, Mr. George. Thank you for your time here on Newsdex. We're casting no. our minds back nine years ago. On that day, your team was quite busy. Share with me your reflections. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning to our viewers. I think about three, four years ago, we issued, <clears throat> on the fifth anniversary, we issued uh, a release we said never again. Uh, it, it's true, that day we were there. NADMO was uh, very present and to do what we can as much as possible to save as many lives as possible uh, in such a dangerous situation. And then the lives lost. Uh, we had to do what we could to recover uh, those lives that were lost. Uh, people, some were brought out not completely dead and had to be revived uh, with the medical, uh, to be sent to medical facilities. Not more was all of that and very present to support. And in the process too, we did registration of people uh, who were affected. And then later, when government decided to support, uh, we used that as a basis to support the people. Unfortunately, some people registered with other NGOs and their names were not captured by the NAMO list. And, and that brought some problems when we were doing uh, the government support for the affected victims. Uh, so. Uh, those were some of the initial remarks that I can make, uh, recollecting June 3rd disaster. Have there been significant improvements in desilting storm drains and removing structures that block waterways since the disaster? Because that was one of the major reasons why we experienced that tragic disaster. Yes, uh, on the safety enforcement of safety protocols, I would say yes. Uh, the National Petroleum Authority has been up and doing in partnership with the Ghana National Fire Service uh, to ensure uh, the strict enforcement of safety protocols in discharge of fuel and gasoline products. Uh, and that, on that score, I would say yes, uh, there's been much improvement on the issue of uh, distorting our dreams. And, and yes, it's become an annual ritual. Uh, government has got dread masters in the door, and, and they've been doing consistent work this certain and dredging the other and the other ones to not move in partnership with the assembly have been doing consistent uh this certain and dredging of uh, some of the other major storm drains and and fortunately the garage project support is also tailored towards that consistent uh, dredging and then getting uh, maintenance works on our major drains and some of our minor drains and so yeah that, that i would say there's been uh, improvement, but there's room for uh, more improvement. We can do better than we are doing now. Mm. For many people who survived that incident, they are now living with scars, scarred for life. What policy changes have been implemented to prevent a reoccurrence of such disaster? Policy changes to do what? To prevent a reoccurrence of such disasters as NADMO. Yes, 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 yes. That's what I said. Uh, uh, ensuring that the safety protocols in the discharge of gas and gasoline products uh, is being strictly enforced, especially under the leadership of the NPA, uh, that is being done. The partnership with the district assemblies to ensure that uh, we engage communities, flood prone areas, and then we dredge our drains. Government is ensuring that the Ministry of Works and Housing is constructing more drains, storm drains and gutters and co to ensure that uh, our waters, the flood waters, are able to flow freely. Uh, these are things that uh, government is ensuring. That, and then NADMO is also ensuring that it's done so that uh, we can avoid this. We've issued a statement never again. And so our policies and steps that we are taking is to ensure that indeed never mm. again should we experience uh, these uh, twin disasters. Mm. How prepared is NADMO currently to handle similar disasters? Should they okay again? Uh, we, we, we've uh, been having consistent training for our men. Uh, we've got some logistical support, and um, we, we're in position to respond. 
uh, in the case of any emergency. We are an emergency response agency, so uh, we, we are prepared to respond in, in such uh, situations. Thank you, Georgia. You see for your time here on Newsdex. Now, let's take you to the Thank courts you. because four legal challenges against the passage of the controversial Human Sexual Rights and Family Values Bill 2024 has been heard at the Accra High Court today. Amanda Odoi and Richard Delaskai have filed cases directly at the Supreme Court questioning the bill's passage. Additionally, Paul Sefa and Priest Obri Kranting have brought separate challenges to the High Court. President Gufado has restrained himself from signing the bill until these outstanding cases are cleared, a position the minority in Parliament have condemned. But the Judicial Service is allowing the media full access to the hearing today. And my colleague Latif Idrisu, member of the Legal Affairs Dex, has been in court. He joins me now with more. Latif, how did it go in court today? Aisha, so it's a bit noisy here. Uh, I'm just trying to see if I understood your question, mm. what, whether or not the, the case has been heard yet. Yes, yeah, so I want to know how it Was went that your in question, court. Aisha? I want to know how proceedings went in court because we know the case has been heard. Yes, so it was a very brief proceedings, Aisha. Uh, all parties sat, and in fact, let's reiterate the fact that this is a historic moment uh, with regards to the reshaping the judicial frontiers of the Republic of Ghana. For the first time in the history of this country, TV cameras were allowed into the High Court, the High Court, we know for the Supreme Court, uh, as a result of the petitions in the elections, we've had two live broadcasts from the Supreme Court. And then we had this LGBTQ1 adding on top of it, making it three. But for the first time in the history of this country, we had live TV cameras in the High Court uh, covering the proceedings of this anti-LGBTQ bill, which the president uh, has so far refused to sign into law. It was a very brief proceedings. We know both parties have made their oral submissions. And so today, the court has given them up until July 29 to submit their written submissions. So the plaintiff has up until July 4 to submit his written submission. Then the Attorney General and the Speaker of Parliament also have up until 29th of July to file their written submission. So on the 29th of July, the court will reconvene and then a determination will be made on this matter and then we will know how the trial will proceed, Aisha. Now, it's for Sina, but the Judicial Service has granted the media full access to court proceedings. Uh, tell us how it felt like today in court. Well, so like I mentioned, you know the Supreme Court has already broken that ceiling, if you like. Uh, it's, it's the apex. So once the apex court has done that, uh, coming down to the High Court isn't such a novel, if you like, but it is new. It has never happened in the High Court. Uh, it was interesting to find out we didn't have a lot of media outlets covering this historic day. Uh, there were just about three or four cameras in the courthouse, in the courtroom, and just a handful of journalists who sat through the proceedings. Uh, and uh, like I mentioned, it's because the Supreme Court has already broken that ceiling. Uh, so the High Court doing it isn't such a novel, but it is historic, we must put on record. Thank you, Latif Idrisu, member of our Legal Affairs Dex here on Joy News. Now, let's do some political stories because the police has apprehended the constitution organizer of NDC in the Wutusenya East constituency following a bloody clash over a voter transfer center at a voter transfer center in the central region. Now, Atu Kumsin, who is the son of the member of parliament for Wutusenya East, Mavis Hawa Kumsin, was stabbed during the clash. Now, the violence we know stemmed from issues alleged to be triggered by the NPP's attempt to transport people willing to transfer their vote to the center, which was resisted by the NDC. Now, some members of the NDC and the MPP are reported to have sustained significant injuries. MPP Constituency Secretary Michael Adi confirmed the incident to Joe News. 
uh, around 4.30 there about. We had a call to the effect that there's a misunderstanding regarding the sitting arrangement at the uh, uh, registration center, which compel us to rush to the scene. In fact, my good friend and brother, Atukumsi, got here even before I did. And so he called me to the effect that the misunderstanding is escalating situations. And so we should hurry up and get here. And so I asked him what really is the issue. And according to him, when he got here, he realized that the NDC have decided more or less to do what they have planned. And what is that which they have planned? Their plan is that because they are unable to bring out people to come and do the transfer, they are going to frustrate the process. Because before this incident, we had picked intelligence to the effect that they want to attack us. They want to attack us. So yesterday, we were not surprised that the divisional police commander came here and ordered that all chairs must be parked and that people must not be allowed to queue in the, uh, 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 in the night. So we all left only for them to come back and claim that there are people are in the queue when in fact we cannot see the people with our naked eyes. So that, that is what generated into all this misunderstanding. So I too just came with the mindset that as a leader, he want to calm situations down so that everybody will be at peace with him or herself. Unfortunately, without any provocation, without any attack, a gentleman from nowhere just popped up with a knife and then assaulted our, 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 our brother. So that is what has happened this morning, which is so unfortunate. Yes, the gentleman in question who stabbed our friend has been arrested. And we have also been told by the police commander that they have invited the constituency organizer for the NDC, who happens to be present at the time of the incident, my good friend Danny, as well as their youth organizer, who was the kingpin, who was the kingpin in all this bohaha, has also been invited by the police. So we are going to follow this case to its full conclusion and ensure that what is right is right, irrespective of who is involved. Well, the NDC has issued a statement condemning the violence and calling for thorough investigations into the issue. The Lali Sewako is NDC Utsian is constituency communications officer. We'll hear from him shortly, but I've just been told now that the Electoral Commission has called for an emergency IPAC meeting and my colleague Samuel Imbura is there. He joins me live with more. Samuel, tell us what's happening. Well, uh, at the well, uh, EC office here in, in Ridge, the, uh, the political parties, civil society organizations uh, are meeting the EC over the, uh, I mean, the voter transfer exercise uh, in which you've just um, heard the story concerning the Kaswa chaos that emanated from both political parties. So um, the, the main agenda of this IPAC meeting is to look at some of these challenges and then um, see how they can reach a compromise so the political parties would not have a different view from the Electoral Commission. Um, just some few minutes ago, uh, Dr. Bosman Asari uh, arrived uh, from the, uh, the EC to join the, the meeting. The political party representatives are also here waiting for the meeting to kick start, but I must say it hasn't started yet. Uh, even before the start of this particular meeting, um, at the EC corporate office here, we have the Ayawasu West, Ayawasu Central, East, and the Kualiklote constituencies. Uh, this is where they do their voter transfer. So one issue that has come up is the uh, fact that there is a communication circulating on social media and that the, the EC has directed its officials not to allow any political party agent to um, uh, monitor the whole exercise. And this has actually incensed the, the NDC. Earlier, Omani Boama of the NDC uh, met with the EC officer who told his officers not to uh, monitor the exercise. Uh, he wasn't quite happy about it and directed his, uh, I mean, his agents to monitor the exercises vigilantly because they are suspecting foul play from the EC. From the own words of uh, Mr. Omani Boama, the EC is trying 
to compromise the exercise. So right behind me, these are official, I mean, agents from the NPP, and we have other people coming up as well to uh, register or transfer their vote. Let me just get to the coordinator of the NPP to find out from him whether he is aware of this particular uh, communication. Because Mr. Omani Boama is claiming that they have not been communicated to and then they don't have any prior notice about it. Moreover, it is illegal and they wouldn't allow it to happen. So these are the agents from the uh, NPP and they are waiting patiently and monitoring the whole exercise. Let me just talk to the coordinator here to find out from him what, the, what he makes of it so far. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on the Joy News channel. Uh, your name and uh, what do you do in the NPP? Okay, my name is Honorable Eric Do. I'm the constituency organizer for the NPP. In the also Central West? Kote Kole constituency okay. and the leader of the team at EC. All right, so we had the NDC uh, leveling ac accusations against the EC and also the MPP that, I mean, you are conniving with the EC to compromise the elections uh, and it starts now. There is actually a communication, I have cited that, that suggests that you, the um, agents, are not supposed to go closer to it. Do you have prior notice about this or you came to learn about it here? Okay, that is yesterday when I had information that all agents are not supposed to be at the polling center. They should move away. And I support the easy idea of doing that. Because yesterday, for instance, we had a problem in Ayawaso West. Why go? They were fighting based on lines. The two parties, the agents, were fighting based on lines. So I felt it. If this is what the AC is saying, then I support it. Then I have so to the, come. The reason is what? I mean, people are coming from different constituencies to transfer their votes. What are we talking? Are they different people or they are the same people that they are in the register? So once I feel like I've moved from um, um, Odududu and I'm in a salam down possible I have to come and transfer my votes there. Some are also working at the market, let's say Odona market. They are living in Kaswa. Okay. And that day of election is going to be it's not um, a holiday. It's a working day. So I can't leave my work at Kaswa. Or I can't leave my Kaswa and come to Accra and work and go back. So definitely they feel comfortable registering or Voting at the center that. So the bottom serve. line is you are not against the directive by the ECS. Of course, of course, I'm not. I don't. I don't. But what are anything. the issues you have observed here that you have objections to? The issues has to do with the line and the and the noise. The noise has to do with um, you coming after me. Sometimes we consider the old and and the uh, aged and also breastfeeding mothers. Also, we consider them. Samuel Mbura there interacting with some party agents for the NPP. We are told that the EC has called for an emergency IPAC meeting following violent clashes at Ewutu Senya EC yesterday. Now, the EC has also directed that party agents should not be close to the registration centers. And we're bringing you that live in subsequent bulletins. My name is Faustina Safo. We're taking a quick breather here on Newsdex. We'll be back with more. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Deputy Managing Director of TALO, uh, Cynthia Lumor, has said that the partnership between the oil firm and Youth Bridge Foundation will establish a crucial network to provide young people with accelerated support through mentoring and essential skills training. She shared these insights at the launch of the TALO Alumni Connect in Accra. All right, we'll bring you that story in a bit. The Equus Brown Card Insurance has settled claims of over 3 million cities in the last couple of years to accident victims in, sub, in the sub-region. The scheme caters for citizens of Equus states who travel across the sub-region. Addressing the media at an enforcement exercise with the MTTD of the Ghana Police, General Secretary of the Ghana Bureau, uh, Richard Ishen, called on motorists to insist on the collection of their Equus Brown Card Insurance.
The ECOWAS Brown Card Scheme seeks to ensure prompt and fair compensation to victims of motor accidents caused by non-resident motorists traveling to and from other ECOWAS member states, resulting in death, injuries and property damage. The purchase of a motor insurance policy in Ghana automatically includes the Brown Card Insurance Scheme. The protocol was adopted on May 29, 1982 in Kutonu, Benin, to mark the 42nd anniversary of the scheme, the Ghana Secretariat organized an enforcement exercise with the Motor Traffic and Transport Unit of the Ghana Police Service on transit vehicles from the ECOWAS sub-region. Speaking to the media, the General Secretary of the Ghana Bureau, Richard Ishen, charged motorists to insist on collecting their ECOWAS brown card insurance certificates. In Ghana, when you buy your auto insurance policy, you have also paid for uh, the Equus Brown Card Insurance. That means that if you buy your motor insurance policy, you have to insist on the insurance company to take your motor, um, Equus Brown Card certificate. And this will allow you to travel to the neighboring countries, all the West African countries. They are 14 it. Oh, if you go there and there's any accident, this is the insurance that will cover you. Regarding claims payment, he noted that the scheme has paid over 3 million CDs in claims to victims. If you look behind you, you see all the Burkina trucks. Um, as a matter of a couple of weeks ago, we were in Burkina Faso and uh, we settled claims over 150 million CFA, which is about 3 million Ghana cities. You, you understand? So I would say this has been very successful and it complements the objective of ECOWAS. You know, the objective of ECOWAS is to um, economic integration and promote free movements of goods and services persons. And uh, when people come to your country and they get into accident, there is this there that will provide them with the necessary coverage that they need. Chief Superintendent Alexander Obeng, Public Affairs Director at the Motor Traffic and Transport Department of the Ghana Police, urged motorists to comply with road traffic regulations and prioritize the renewal of their insurance policies to ensure their safety and the safety of other road users. We must share with the millions of residents in West Africa and in Ghana of the need to also come on board to support the state in ensuring the smooth implementation of insurance, motor insurance policy in this country. And by extension, ensure that we allow free flow of traffic across our border, protected, and residents in Ghana also assured that such vehicles as are delivered on our road across our borders also have existing, valid and appropriate insurance that is also issued to such road users by the Equal Grand Card Office. And that's it for this segment. The news returns after the break. You're still watching Newsdex and opinions are divided whether the teacher licensure exams should be cancelled or not. Well, some have argued that the policy which was introduced six years ago is needless because teachers who sit for the exams have already gone through accreditation processes and institutions. And we'll be giving you more of that story in subsequent bulletin in our hotline documentary, License to Teach. My name is Faustina Safa. For more news, please. Log on to myjoonline.com. Have a pleasant morning.